Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever or whenever you are. Welcome to the Lightning Podcast, where we discuss and explore the weekly meditations without necessarily reaching any conclusions. I am your host, Cyrus Polisbon, and I'm joined today by Dr. Zohar Atkins, and Dudek, and Nicolas Sarian. Welcome, guys. Please call uh, me Lord and Savior. <laughs> My Lord. <laughs> My lord, Prithi, explain to me the quote of Monday. Monday's... Gene Bowden. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> lord. Before we explain it, let's oh, sorry. decide it. <laughs> so guys, let's, uh, I'd like to cover Monday's meditation quote. Um because I loved it and I love the art that you chose for it, Nico. Um, and the quote is, Work without hope draws nectar in a sieve, and hope without an object cannot live. Again, work without hope draws nectar in a sieve, and hope without an object cannot live. Nice little rhyme there, but what the heck does it mean? Why does hope need direction? It just makes me think of work, 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 work. Like it is, it's, you know, before we get into the meaning, I think like obviously the <clears throat> work, work has such a poppy sound to it in the context of poetry and lyric. It's a big topic mm. in sort of pop songs. It's like the relationship to work, right? Like with Britney Spears, you got to work, bitch, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, it just goes to show we were already doing that in the 19th century with romanticism in a way. What mm. is the work? Is the work, right? The nine to five? Is it? Is it your professional career broadly? Um, is it your life on earth? So that's not an answer to the question, but I think like, define the work we we talk in um in sort of yeah. like pop psychology like do, doing the work oh i did that work i'm doing inner work i'm working on myself so yeah yeah i think work <laughs> is just work is action as action towards a goal i guess that's how i would define it in my newbie lexicon so i think the the straightforward meeting right of nectar and a sieve is um, nectar is this sweet, sweet thing. Uh, it is the food of gods. It's the thing that you most want. Uh, it's the feeling of paradise. And drawing it in a sieve, which is a strainer, is um, trying to contain it using the wrong instrument. Yeah. So um, holding paradise in an instrument in which paradise is leaking out of it, um, that is what we should have in mind when thinking about how our relationship to work without any sense of hope. Like basically hope would be the thing that allowed us to contain the nectar. And without it, it's like we have all these holes and the, the nectar is just falling through it. Uh, we could definitely talk yeah. about that, but I think there, there's a sort of contrarian or against the grain reading, which is like, who says it's a bad thing to work without hope? Um, who says it's a bad thing for the nectar to be leaking out? Like maybe you're still <clears throat> catching something in that sieve. Like you're catching the, the, the part of the nectar that, that isn't liquid, that's solid enough to sort of uh, remain, even though there are holes. What would, what would those solid chunks be? I think it <laughs> has to do with like just showing up. Hmm. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of just, you know what, like, don't brood so much, just, just show up, stop making excuses, execute. You don't Grit. need to know what, what the answer to the meaning of life is or why you're doing what you're doing. Or if mm. you didn't like your job, just like, just show up and put in those reps. And that's the pulp. The pulp is that the, the, the hope will emerge from the practice as opposed to sort of waiting mm. for the hope to guide the practice. Mm. Oh, that, the, go that's ahead. Beautiful. Cyrus. The pulp, the pulp. Yes. Because you, if you accumulate enough pulp, it becomes a, a new bottom for the sieve and then you contain the liquid. Mm. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's sort of a debate in a lot of wisdom traditions between sort of how much intentionality do you need um, in order to be able to be said to be authentic. 
-hmm. So like with Paul and sort of Christianity, there's this idea of like, you can't obey the law unless you have the spirit. But if you don't have the spirit, then like your pursuit of the law is hypocritical and sort of counterproductive. And in other traditions, like in my tr Jewish tradition, there's a the view that behavior itself expresses and contains the intent. And so therefore you can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something a little bit provocative here. You can almost be mindless and without intentionality and be merely ritualistic. And actually that's fine because there's a certain pulp to that. There's a certain consistency to that, even if you know, you're just going through the motions. Yeah. Hmm. Because you've committed to a discipline. Yeah. I don't think I don't think that's what Coleridge is saying. I think the romantics probably more on the side of like you need to have intentionality for it to be meaningful. But um Well hello. <laughs> we've got we've got Francis Pedraza joining us. What's up, man? Hi guys. What's up? What's up? We were right? just Cyrus. We were Summarize, summarize the, give the quote back and then summarize my interpretation of it. We were just discussing um, Monday's quote, uh, work without hope draws nectar in a sieve and hope without an object cannot live. And um, Zohar was explaining to us, um, you know, the nectar being the, uh, the sweet part of life, um, you know, traditionally the food of the gods and it falling through a, a, a holding container with um, holes in it um, and losing so much of the value. But Zohar argued that um, sometimes there is more than just nectar and there's solid crystallized chunks that get caught anyways. Um, and sometimes uh, that's enough. And so showing up to work without hope um, or a kind of optimism and just having the grit to just commit and show up regardless is a, uh, has its own value. Um, and then we made a couple jokes and about that and whatnot, but I'm curious to know, uh, how you feel about it. How do I feel about this quote? Um, work without hope draws nectar in a sea. Hope without an object cannot live. Um, I've, uh, I'm trying to think about whether I've experienced both of these. There definitely have been moments where I was pretty hopeless. Um, so, um, when invisible, um, in its first six months, uh, we were running the company 200 miles per hour at a wall and forcing the, forcing the wall to move. And then of course, eventually we crashed into the wall. Um, and we ran out of money and everyone quit except for five other people. And, um, and we had one client, um, and we we're somehow trying to like rebuild from the ruins. Um, and then to add insult to injury, we had, um, a security event where somebody hacked into our system and, and deleted a bunch of data. And, um, <laughs> And we ended up getting the data back, but it was just like, it was, it really felt like at that point, I remember there was a moment where I was like, I went out into nature and I sort of yelled at God. I was like, you know, come on, why? You know, like, like, you know, really it like, can it possibly be lower? Like what, what is the message here? And, um, and for over a year for like 18 months, um, there was a lot of hopeless days and, and then there was a lot of like, hope um that was just literally hope and it's like you would start to look at your hope and you're like okay i'm experiencing the emotion of hope i'm experiencing the imagination that someday invisible could be a hundred million dollar company or you know uh a billion dollar company or a ten billion dollar company or whatever this could be so huge is this hope baseless or does it have a base and uh, this is actually still an issue today in our board board level conversations. If you are a rationalist and you pl apply, uh, you know, a probability analysis, 
the probability of most of these upside events occurring is 0 0.0000, like one, you know, it's like incredibly low probability. It's like that moment in Star Wars where he's like, damn the statistics, you know, um, like never tell it's me higher, the odds. It is, you know? it is higher though than human life existing from the point of view of the first day of creation and Correct. also <laughs> much higher than the chances of any one of us existing, uh, even just going back five or 10 generations and saying, what are the chances that those various combinations of sperm and egg will produce, you know, our unique genetic sequence. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is higher, but most people to the extent to which they can control it, don't like taking risks with 0.0001% probability of success. Um, and they don't like putting all of their life force energy into them. So there was a lot of battling in my own psyche to get to some sort of confidence that my hope was not just romantic, but actually grounded. And this is like a good yin yang, because I think you kind of do need to like, you do need to hold the two intention. Um, and we talk about like internalizing the, uh, the devil's advocate, right? Like you red team and then blue team yourself a lot. So like, you know, I would like write up a thing was this is why I think this is going to succeed. And then, and then I would write up the counter of like, this is why I could fail. And then, and then I would sort of keep that debate going long enough to see if I could isolate something I could do to actually increase the probability. And then I'd focus on that thing. And that would actually, having that debate with myself between like the gray world where everything ends up terrible and like a nightmare and the like hopeful world where everything ends up like utopia, the, having that debate was actually a hugely valuable exercise because it sort of focused my energy on, on, on where in the battle I could like score a point. I could actually do something today that would like, you know, score a point for hope and, and take a point away from the hopelessness. And that actually would give me the energy to keep going and experience like victory. Hmm. Yeah. Object. Yeah. Hope, hope because if you're holding, object. if you're holding the whole war, if the whole war is the thing that you're hoping for victory on, that's, that's almost like too big. But if you can just win one victory, like one battle and then another battle and another battle, then, you know, it's a much more local analysis and, and you can actually mm -hmm. get to higher levels of confidence that like, okay, it might be 0.01% chance of me succeeding overall, but if I can get to 80% chance that I complete this project, that's good odds. Let's win the project, you know, and do, do the next thing. Hmm. How Would do you... we benchmark against both of those? Because like one is hyper short-sighted and the other is hyper far-sighted. So if you like sort of optimize too much for, you know, achieving your goals, then you maybe ignore the more ambitious, like long-term thing that provides the romanticism and the dream and allows other people to be excited about it. But if you're just like, wow, I've got the sickest vision ever, like look, we're going <laughs> to take over the world. Right. And people are like, okay, but like, what's your plan this week? Like, what did you do? <laughs> um, why should I, you know, believe in that? Like I, you know, I just pitched someone and he was like, your manifesto, your lightning manifesto reads more like sizzle than steak. <laughs> and I think, right. That is like another mi mixed metaphor in the mix. It's like, it's, 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 it's good nectar, but like, what's your container for it? How do I know it's not <laughs> just all going to leak out? <laughs> um, but, but you like the, so most people hear that and they experience shame and the first reaction they have is should I unpublish the manifesto or should I like issue an apology or should I like, should I quit or fold or whatever, you know, but like there's a way that you can turn that into the sand in your oyster where mm. now you've internalized the critic's voice, the accuser's voice. And now you can write lightning manifesto version 0 0.2. And then, and then now you can address the critic and like, you know, I heard a critic who said, this is more sizzle than steak. Let me give you some steak. And then boom, 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 boom. And then guess what? Then you're going to talk to the same person, forward it to them. And they're going to give you some new like snarky remark and snarky analysis. But there's going to be some glimmer of truth in their criticism. And then you're going to write Lightning Manifesto 0 0.3. <laughs> and, and that, or, um, that or is... Or I'm going to say, baby, the steak is the sizzle. I'm sizzle as a service. There you go. <laughs> Oh my God. We're quoting that. <laughs> this is more of a service. <laughs> Writing that down. And how how do you relate to the quote? You you've you've got this sort of digestive nodding going on. 
Yeah, I think that uh, I kind of like we talked about at the beginning, like Zohar, you first mentioned, like, what is the definition of work? In no way, shape or form did my mind ever associate this quote with like work that is like financial salaried work. Like it was much more of like an emotional kind of like psychological work. Um, and so it was interesting to hear you guys talk about this in like relationship to jobs or careers or companies, uh, because it contained none of that association when I read it for the first time, nor the fifth time, nor the 10th time. <laughs> so. So what is work? For, what's the work for you? I think like as someone who suffers from depression, I think it had a lot to do with like the work you do towards survival. And like, especially when those bit days are really bad, it's like, where is hope? It's, and, and finding it kind of again and again. Uh, so for me, it took on that kind of bent. Sorry, getting a little emotional. Um, great quote, <laughs> Nico. It's, like a, it's a beautiful quote. And, um, That's so, a beautiful quote. <laughs> Go ahead, Nico. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I was going to, I mean, you, you, there was a, um, what I was thinking about when Zohar was talking about this is, I mean, what is work? And work is suffering. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, well, what I mean by this is like, I mean, if, if you enjoy it, you don't call it work, you call it play or, you know, uh, so. One of the things that I was thinking about when, when Francis was talking about this is another quote by Eskilos from Agamemnon, which goes, because um, like, okay, wait a second. So we talk about work and the sieve and the nectar and all of this, but nobody talks about, okay, well, what about the experience of not, not having hope? You know, that, that's, that this is an experience in itself or the consciousness of that. So there's a, there's a quote by Eschylus, and we're not trying to like, you know, take the Coleridge thing out, which goes, topate uh, matos, which means uh, in, well, in English, um, through suffering experience. No? So mm -hmm. through, through, through suffering you learn, basically. And, and I think that's the experience that mm -hmm. most people do not get, uh, which is, again, maybe I'm backtracking to other, you know, conversations we had in the podcast, but that... What about the experience of not having hope? Uh, hope, hope can be a form of suffering. In some ways, it's easier to not have hope because the the reward isn't dangling in front of you, and you then you sort of calibrate your expectations differently when you're hopeless as when you're hoping for something. And, um, think of Sisyphus, who's tortured by hope. Um, every time he gets to the top, he's like, "This time is going to be different." Yeah. <laughs> I'm reminded of the Sylvia. Oh, but, but that, no, but that would be hope without an object. That would be a second part of the quote, mm. right? Oh, I think I he mean... has an object. His, he, he has an object. He just, um, ho hope without an object. I, I, I interpret hope, at, hope without an object as in, um, like, you have this vague sense of Optimism. how tomorrow is going to be better, but no actual ability to visualize right. sort of what that means. But but my, my 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 reaction to that would be to say, oh, you know, like religion is the opium of, of the masses. Marx was right, you know. I mean, it's still a good drug. Hope is still a good drug, you know. Uh, <laughs> throw, Nico. We, we, narco we can narcoticize our, our existence, and that's <laughs> the, you know that's the, <laughs> by like believing in other worlds. Like, I mean, it's like either you. I, mean, I don't want to do like the other we... world things. The other the other world <laughs> yeah. thing is exactly Marx, Marx... exactly is the solution. <laughs> Marx, yeah. Marx clearly didn't experiment enough with different religions to realize that some religions are opiates and others are more like uh, speed and amphetamines. <laughs> but, um, I... <laughs> right. Or he, did, or, he didn't, or he didn't experiment enough with drugs okay. in general. Um, <laughs> you, what, is, what, is, what, is the, what is the crack, crack for the masses, you know? Um, wow. Right. <laughs> I mean, opi opium is one drug, right? That's, that's like the, the whole point, I think. It's... You can still like take something to live more intensely and not like sleep through it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, the uh, so let's go to the other worlds thing. Um, it doesn't seem like animals uh, imagine other worlds. Um, uh, maybe they do. We just don't realize it. But um, you know, humans humans can uh, spend most of their time 
in another world. Um, and, um, and so you, you see in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, which is the Christian idea of manifesting the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is very much similar to what most artists or most entrepreneurs experience as manifestors. They have an aesthetic vision of the sublime that sometimes they get glimpses of. So like Wordsworth would go to the English Lake District and see the sublimity and he'd see sort of heaven on earth. Um, or like, um, you know, you can imagine a, plain, a painter like William Turner, um, you know, seeing the sublimity and, and, and trying to capture it. But uh, th- what sort of makes that art and not a photograph is that it starts to become a thing of the imagination. And this is where fantasy as a genre is like very much this this like letting the imagination run wild with with like what is the sublime and, and what would it look like and what is the difference between what we would wish for in utopia, what we would wish for in the perfect realm and what actually is. Um, and you see that this is why we call the Temenos and Alexandra the Temenos, this liminal space, because like poetry is very much in that liminality between, you know, the secular, which is a study of what is. Um, and, and then the religious, which is kind of a study of, of what, what ought or what we, you know, what would be the ideal. Um, so you have Keats saying a thing of beauty is a joy forever. It's loveliness increases. It shall never pass into nothingness. This is like, um, uh, the, the poetic imagination. Um, and, uh, I'll pause there. Uh, There's more to say on this, but yeah. I was going to just, um, understand this through a different lens, which is, when you have two worlds, no, what you, I mean, this is classic Augustine. Um, what you have is what other people call political theology. And what I mean by this is that you can derive the laws of this world by justifying the existence of another world. Nobody yes. knows or has experienced that other world, but people believe in it. So you can, in a sense, justify I mean, Zohar is going to, I'm, I'm going to get a lot of heat from Zohar now, I think, but if you can justify um, the laws of this world through the laws of a world that we suppose that is, you know, de- deduced through logic and rationality, and this is what the, the scholastics did, no? But it's by positing a mystery, you can apply a law. So mm-hmm. mis- that's kind of the way, yeah. Um, Nika, um, you got to... <laughs> Um, yeah. do me, do me the kindness of making it personal. Like I, I get, I yeah. get the, I get the relationship to Aeschylus and Marx and all. It's so fun. I love, I could do that for hours, but how does it land for you as a practice? Like Anne shared about her struggle with depression and like it was so moving. Like, mm-hmm. let's get back to that heart space. Totally. <laughs> the, the funny thing is I'm going to say something, um, like for me, this applies all to my life. Like it's not like I'm thinking about the, you know. But what I mean is, I truly believe that you are told who you are. You know, you know what I mean. So like, um, you might have some sort of, let's say, quest for like hope or a search for meaning, and all of these ideas that are super in vogue now because everybody has anxiety and and depression and stuff. And I, my my personal the way i feel about this is that yes because you need to be told by by someone there's nobody who tells you anymore and uh, so you try to tell yourself who you are and uh well that's more complicated um, so how does that than, relate to, uh, to hope the being told well it's it's like you're yearning for an answer right mm. Um, I do. I would love to have God pop up right now and tell me what's up, you know. That, that would be amazing. I do not have that experience. <laughs> are you but, sure that uh, are you sure that you want that? There's a great movie called yeah. Orday or or Death. It's a Danish film where <laughs> mm-hmm. it's nineteen fifty four, I think, where Jesus or some guy who claims to be Jesus comes to a small Danish village and he's like, I'm the reincarnation of Christ. Your prayers have been answered. Um and like everyone's like you're a crazy guy like you're not jesus and he's like well you talk about how you want the second coming like you got it um of of course you could you could sort of say um that it's a fake but then it's like well wouldn't it always be fake in a way and then um i I don't want to sort of give away the ending but i'll kind of give it away because it's one of those movies where no matter what you it's an ambiguous ending but basically like a miracle happens 
And the question is like, do you accept that it's a miracle or do you always reduce the miracle back to rationality? It's like, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's absurd that this guy would, would do a miracle because like, that doesn't happen. And so that's why the viewer and most of the people in the film are, are going to sort of deny the miracle. And then you realize like, it doesn't matter whether it's first coming, second coming, third coming, like it's the same fundamental structure, which is like, yeah, religion might be an opiate of the masses. And that's true 99.999 repeating percent of the time. But isn't there an opening, a space between that and infinity that Francis was alluding to the point oh 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 forever 1% that sort of um, in which there really is a miracle and cynicism is the opiate of the elites. <laughs> but wait, um, wait a second. To speak. <laughs> <laughs> when I said religion is the opponent of the masses, I didn't mean it in a pejorative way. Like, I'm, I'm, I mean, what I, I'm like, the point is, is there a life without drugs? That, that, that's the, my, yeah. You know, is that's the point. I mean, there's, there's a way to interpret Marx in that way, like, uh, like, why opium, um, and and drugs? Have all, I mean, it, I mean, yeah. I'm going in circles here, but uh, I, I was not trying to mean that in a pejorative no, it's, way. It's, it's, like, yeah. I, I I get it, but but I think like yeah. whether you're pro or or con, the analysis with Marx and sociology of religion is like focused on the utility of religion. Right. So he also says religion is a haven in a heartless world, which is a more a nicer thing to say, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, but even there, it's like, OK, well, that's why people need religion or use religion. But what about the truth of it? Like, that's where I'm getting at with the miracle is the, the, the experience of religion separate from whether the observer is like, well, that's a nice drug or that's a bad drug. Like, you know, kids these days with their opiates. Um, and it's like, yeah, but what about the uh, what about the idea that you're on opium or you're on something and you have an insight and that insight is real and maybe it was activated by the right. delusional state or uh, enhanced state, but that doesn't mean it's not any more or less profound than those people. No, but, but right. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to justify drugs, but what the point is the following is that there is reality or what we call reality. And then you take a drug and then you have some sort of a other worldly experience, right? For which, it's otherworldly because this is the base reality. And to me, that's the problem. It's like, okay, but this year also has drugs. <laughs> yes, correct. You know, correct. Uh, uh, Our base that's, state, that's we, are, my... we are a bunch of chemicals. We're a bunch of chemicals, <laughs> you know. And so um, uh, if you've ever been sick, uh, you realize how much just, you know, even within a totally sober state, you know, small changes um, can totally affect you. And, 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 um, uh, if you go through a breakup, you know, you realize, oh my gosh, like your, your, your psyche and your perspective on the world can change. And actually philosophy alone and art alone, <clears throat> this is part of the idea of lightning. It's like, it's, it, you know, the sizzle is the stake, you know, sizzle is the service. Is that like, you know, we can do things to shift our state, um, uh, in, in a way that is chemical without chemicals. Um, well, that's alchemy. It, it's alchemical. It's yeah. my, well, that's right. why our that's why our band is is my alchemical romance. <laughs> but the nature is alchemy. That's the whole point. I mean, yeah. the transmutation of metals already happens on a millionaire level. You don't have to be a human to like you know participate in alchemy. I mean, this is why I said like topatematos. So like for instance, suffering is a. I mean, call it an inchemical balance in the most like banal way, but it's still it's still a change. I mean, it's the first part. It's the opus nigrum. It's the blacks. It's the the, the nigredo. Yeah. So like, uh, we just don't like that, or we just don't understand the meaning of that anymore. Uh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta dose up on my philosophy because I'm alchemically imbalanced. <laughs> um, uh, let's let's actually let's go back to to. Uh, I just want the, to start throwing in alchemy. Pump. I'll take I'll take the opium. I'll take the opium. I don't need the food. <laughs> go ahead, Francis. <laughs> Let's go back to human versus squirrel. Squirrel. Um, so, like, who you know, who is superior? We think we're so superior because, unlike the squirrel, we can imagine you know uh, utopia. We can imagine uh, squirrel kingdom, um, as the squirrel can't imagine squirrel kingdom. The squirrel can just see or feel or think whatever the squirrel sees or you know, the thing. So, so you, there, there's a point of view 
um, in which the squirrel is braver uh, and morally superior to the human with the imagination because the human with the imagination is escaping into this imaginary hopeful place. Um, in a way, a way uh, the human is, is going pure software, no hardware. You know, they're, they're, they're exiting. Um, uh, whereas the squirrel has the bravery um, to, uh, to look at reality as it is. And there's a T.S. Eliot line about hope in the Four Quartets, East, Co- East Coker section. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love. For love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you're not ready for thought. I'll stop there. It keeps going. It's very beautiful and poetic. Mm. But um, the, uh, um, the a lot of postmodern thought, um, I mean, even from Nietzsche, and thus, thus spoke Zarathustra and the death of God onwards, was this idea that somehow... You know, are we brave enough to live in a world without an afterlife? Are we brave enough to live in a world without utopia? Are we brave enough to live in a world without miracles? Are we brave enough to live in a world without um, without hope where uh, very quickly, um, you know, everything becomes Darwinian, um, everything becomes self-interested, mm-hmm. everything becomes very materialist um, and, uh, and very nihilistic. Um, and... Uh, there is a, a strange, even in that world, there is this strange possibility for, uh, again, for a kind of nirvana, which is um, what Buddhists practice in um, in Vipassana, which is, okay, fine, like, stop escaping, <clears throat> stay here, stay with the breath, be the squirrel. Isn't, isn't it wonderful to be a squirrel? Isn't it kind of a miracle? Even though the squirrel, even though the squirrel freezes in the winter, and like even though the squirrel like might get bitten by a, I don't know, like eaten by a snake, like even as the squirrel is being eaten by a snake, can the squirrel like can the squirrel be grateful to be a squirrel? Um, and can the squirrel participate in the wonder of the universe? You know, and 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 uh, and um, this um, this need to escape the present it comes from a reaction of suffering in the present. So we. So, but can you, if you can, if you could get to the point where you could deeply accept whatever was presencing, um, whatever was happening in your life and find wonder and joy in that, that would be the true Buddha, so to speak. And this is where the Buddhists have kind of gone the other way, which is like, no, actually, what if even, even suspending the escape hatch, you could find the escape hatch, you know, without without making any sort of premise or any sort of a giant leap of faith. If you just, if you just can uh, find heaven in the present moment. The, the like, isn't it awesome to be a squirrel approach is like the ultimate anti-growth or like degrowth agenda. It's like the West is out there saying like, well, we want to compound GDP at 2%, you know, Correct. annualized. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> you know what? Like, not only do I want to return to like 2000 years ago when we were tribal, because like this whole urban living thing isn't working, it's all alienated. Let's go back to pre-humanity. That was where it was at. You know what? Come to think of it, like language brick, it sucks. Like, like basically just like unwind all scale. Because what is language if not the kind of communication at scale, right? It's like, well, that's mm-hmm. not good. Miscommunication is a function of communication. So you know what? Let's just cancel this whole language thing. How you didn't just cancel squirrelness, but it's better to be a plant. Well, nah, it's actually better to be a stone because, you know, plants even feel something. They're like, oh, where's the sunlight? Stones, they have no desire. Okay, yeah, just be still as a stone. That's good. All right, no, like. <laughs> yeah, you can keep mean, going. You, you, yeah, you, you can keep, keep going. going. You reduce until you get to the source. I think. Yeah, the I source think, is the sun. I think it's awesome to be human. I think it's all awesome. I, I think we shouldn't envy anything. Like. It's sort of like, yeah, it's, it's great to be a child. It's terrible to be a child. It's great to be old. It's terrible to be old. Like, it's great to be a squirrel. It's terrible. Like, everything has its unique challenges. So from that point of view, there's a certain, like, relativism or golden samsara of, like, every sort of, like, feature of light has its equal and opposite feature of darkness. I guess that's Jungian as well. But on another level, I have to say, like, I think that's BS and I would not like the, the proof is in the pudding. Like I don't live that way and I wouldn't give that life advice to anyone. I'm not like, you know what, what you really need to do is be more squirrel. Like I'm like, um, 
you've been up leveled. Congratulations. Like you made it to the next <laughs> level in the video game. Um, and it's hard. Like level one was, was squirrel consciousness. And like you're play you're playing the question of being on human mode. And now that you've passed that level, like you're playing it on modernity mode or you're playing, you know, and so it gets more and more specific and it gets harder and harder, but like the hardness and that goes to Pate Matas, like the hardness is the glory. Difficulty yeah, is great. I, I think the squirrel world, that reality sounds like a punishment to me because I think it's hard because I think for me, like my life centers around making beautiful things and like this kind of like never ending quest for beauty, which is probably what gives me so much anguish at the same time. <laughs> but I think that not having that, like not having the consciousness to like kind of perceive beauty or to recognize it or to try and create it, that to me is like terrible. And, and so I think that with all the suffering, kind of like what Nico said earlier, there comes also the other side of that same coin, which is like the joy, the beauty that, that kind of like follows or pr predecesses it. But yeah, I think squirrel consciousness is not for me because our but, squirrels have no but, art. <laughs> I got, I got to get one more, I got one more snarky comment in, which is just like, it feels so, so obviously a projection to say like to the squirrel, you do you. It's like the squirrel doesn't need to hear that. They just are doing them. But we're like trying to convince ourselves and give ourselves well, we permission know. to you do you by sort of saying to the squirrel that it's okay to be a squirrel because we're so anguished as human beings that we feel it's not okay to just be human. I, well, I don't my know question if, is how I, do we know? I mean, yeah, we how don't, do we know it's obviously. not it's full of its own, <laughs> yeah, its like, own it's beauty? More, it's more <laughs> like, like a stand in for like an entire world philosophy. It's not actually like we're talking about squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was actually there's a, doing there's a Chuang Tzu quote. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, that like you know how we go from like oh quote unquote hunter and gathering societies to like agrarian, no? And there's a well, Cala, Roberto Calasso, the Italian writer, you say no, it's like we used to live with animals, and now we live on animals. So the animal used to be a fellow, like there was a parody there, and then like you're domesticate, domesticate, whatever, and you're like on top of it. And who knows what the really, what that type of relationship was or is like, you know, to actually, you know, respect a tiger for being a tiger, you know, because it actually can kill you. Hmm. Uh, and that's my, I, I think it might go that way. Like if you want to understand how a tiger thinks, well, you have to understand that it can kill you also when it's an equal parody, and you have to experience that. Uh, <laughs> Hence the thought is there any and... human that's so badass they could kill a tiger without weapons uh, I feel like that's like my inner seven year old boy I just needed to ask that question <laughs> I just think <laughs> I mean that you know the inner seven year old believed he could you shouldn't read this but there's a there's a book called Ride the Tiger and you shouldn't read it <laughs> and, and Zohar is not going to like this with this recommendation <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> Delete. Okay, we're gonna lose it completely and we're gonna stay in Chiang Mai and like if you read that we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to kill a tiger. I always wanted one as a pet. I wanted to master it, not kill it. Mm. <laughs> Meow. Um <laughs> Tron tr 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 said. See how the small fish are darting about in the river? That is the happiness of the fish. Hui Si replied, You are not a fish, Chuang Tzu. How do you know what makes fish happy? Chuang Tzu said, You are not me. How do you know that I don't know what makes fish happy? Hui Si replied, Of course I don't know about you, but you are certainly not a fish, so you couldn't possibly know what pleases fish. Zhuang Zi countered, Let's go back to the root of the matter. When you asked how I knew what pleases a fish, you already knew that I knew. I knew it from my feelings standing on this bridge. There's a very similar one. I've heard a, a version of that attributed to Buber, who I think translated Chinese text, um, where two dudes are standing on a bridge and one of them says uh, that water is so cold. And the other one says... Um, 
how do you know that it's cold? And he says, how do you know that I don't know? <laughs> I still don't know what people like. This is a huge, this is a, so basically I'm going to, I'm going to school, I'm going to school you guys. Uh, and by that, I don't, I don't mean you. I mean, like, this is my rare opportunity in life to nerd out and vindicate my five years spent writing a PhD thesis on Heidegger. Um, so the, the, the history of philosophy can be summed up as a, as a basically pendulum swing between the objectivists and the subjectivists. Objectivists believe that there is a, uh, an actual reality out there, and subjectivists believe that perception determines reality or that the only reality is sort of in your experience or your mind. And um, depending on which view you take, you have a, in both you have a problem, which is how does the subject and the object actually connect up? We perceive something that something appears to be other than us. So you can't really say it's all in our heads. Um, but at the same time, do you really want to say it's all out there given what an intense role perception plays in the experience of the objective or the outside world? And Heider comes along and he like flips the script or what do they say in TikTok, flip the switch. Um, and he says, the, the, the problem with the question is the methodology. In both, you, you assume a separation between subject and object and then you're like, well, ain't it the darnest thing? How does the subject and the object, how do those two things get together? Um, and you construct a whole worldview of that, like either subject moving towards object or object morning, moving towards subject. It's like the problem with philosophy is how we actually came to divorce subject and object, treat them as separate, and then like construct a whole uh, worldview ar around their needing to link up. Let's start with something that combines the subject object call it being in the world, and then ask the question of how being in the world could be so disassociated or so alienated or so fallen such that it would come to sort of choose one false horn of this dilemma. Hope that's helpful. Um, I kind of, I side with Heidegger in this. And so um, the, the question of like, are, do squirrels have consciousness or, you know, are they like us? You know, how do we know what they're thinking um, the, those, those questions are, not, are the wrong questions. We're never going to be able to answer them within the framework of analytic philosophy. And what we should really be thinking about is like why we as being in the world, as Dasein, um, have the relationship that we have to the squirrel. And what does that squirrel, what does the squirrel bring up for us in terms of our already given a relationship to intersubjectivity? Because it's not like I went to a school and someone who was like, here's how to talk to other people and read their minds and tell them uh, certain inputs in response to the outputs that they give you. It's like we just, we already know how to do that. And so everything we learn is a revision of this, what do you call it, tradition, this givenness. Um, but, but we're so caught up at like first principles thinking sometimes that we make it more, more hard than it is. And that's, by the way, like why the Heidegger scholars weigh in on the AI debate sometimes and they and they tend to be skeptical of let's say AGI the most advanced version of um, intelligence because the idea that you could construct a machine to have the certain um, being in the world it just doesn't add up so you, you can definitely have an AI that does various mechanical things very impressively but to have this sort of more holistic experience of itself as a Dasein is very hard to imagine that you construct a machine that could, have, that could be a Dasein so it's all it's all an escape from self, whether whether it's I was, a, AI fetishism or squirrel fetishism. I was going to add that, like for I think one of the crucial parts that a lot of people, when when they read Being in Time or when they think about Heidegger, is that I mean I, Heidegger's conception of time is crucial to to the notion of being in the world because we think of time in this kind of like either like a dumb chronology or some form of if you're like a little bit smart, you can think it about as a kenosis. Sorry, not as a kenosis, as a um, as as a kairos. So like time is measured by the moment, let's say the right moment to do things. Not about like present and past and future, but about like a propitious time. So like time all of a sudden becomes kind of a spatial. But the problem in Heidegger is that time and being are interconnected or like they're the same thing at the end of the day. Because being is a form of ecstasy. It's it's a form of coming out of yourself and, and coming back into yourself, and that is time. Mm. So being and time are that's why the, the, that's called it's called being and time. This is the latter part of being and time. But <laughs> oh yeah, one last thing is that, and to your point, Zohar, if you guys are interested in this about like 
being in the world and animals. Uh, there's a there's a book by uh, Giorgio Agamben. I know, I know, Zohar likes him a lot. That's called The Open, where he talks about uh, another guy called Von Uxkul, who was a very big influence on Lacan. That talks about the, the tick, the behavior of a tick, and how actually the tick a tick has kind of the most minimal meaning like meaningless like small animal as uh, you know a kind of a being in the world like character it's just not yeah. the same or the so, tick is an mvp just, it's a minimum viable product of dasein or maybe say mvp right. minimum viable dasein um I, mm-hmm. I i don't take that view though i know uxko influenced heidegger as well because mm-hmm. he was the one who popularized the, the philosophical concept of umwelt which is the world that surrounds you translates his environment but the, mm-hmm. the, for Heidegger, like an animal just is its environment. It, it has a sort of one-to-one simpatico relationship to uh, its surrounding environment. It, it knows where to go. And um, according to Heidegger, the human being it has a much more alienated relationship to the environment. We don't, we don't just dwell, let's say, in, in our homes. We, we, we feel anxiety <laughs> in our home. We feel restlessness in our home. We feel that we don't belong. I don't, no. to, my, to my knowledge... Um, I've never experienced an alienated animal. You can, you can be a grieving animal. Elephants supposedly mourn, right? You can be a happy animal, but can you be, uh, can you, can you feel the question of being like, who am I? I don't, I don't think animals feel that. Who am I? Have I achieved my mission? And the thing is like, the more successful you are in life, it's not like you're like, oh yeah, I've, I've achieved my mission. Like I can show. It's a structure of being. That's Heidegger's point. The anxiety has no correspondence whatsoever to like your objective performance. It's not even the in, in pop psychology they talk about like imposter syndrome. It's not even related to imposter syndrome in the sense of like, oh yeah, just do some power poses and get over it. It's like no, it's that to be human is to always feel that you're somehow out of line with your purpose or your mission. Um, right. And that's what he means by time from a human point of view. Is temporality is actually very different than clock time or calendar time or measurable time it's the the relationship we have to time is that by definition there's never enough time which i think is a good segue for you know wrapping this up in a few minutes (laughs) can i can i see like one so like uh, there's something that i always liked from hegel like which is a kind of a dumbed down hegel which you can you can read hegel and philosophy in general as the search for a home you know the search for an umwelt so like we need to search for for our for our home um, yeah. Last words, anyone? Oh, that sounded like it. good. What do What do we want I'll to give t- people take to it. take away? Yeah, go ahead, Brian Francis. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to give them some poetry to take away. Yes. Go ahead. From Please. <laughs> this is from Hyperion by John Keats, where the Titans are discussing amongst themselves how the Olympians have transcended them. A power more strong in beauty, born of us, and fated to excel us as we pass in glory that old darkness. Nor are we thereby more conquered than by us the rule of shapeless chaos. Say, doth the dull soil quarrel with the proud forests it hath fed, and feedeth still more comely than itself? Can it deny the chiefdom of the green groves? Or shall the tree be envious of the dove because it cooeth, and hath snowy wings to wander wherewithal and find its joys? We are such forest trees, and our fair boughs have bred forth not pale solitary doves, but eagles, golden feathered, who do tower above us in their beauty, and must reign in right thereof. For tis the eternal law that first in beauty should be first in might. Yea, by that law, another race may drive our conquerors to mourn as we do now. Beautiful. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed our conversation, 
perhaps you'd like to join one of your own, um, check out the link in the show notes. Goodbye. <laughs>